Welcome back to the adventure everyone. Things have actually changed quite a lot. This will be part of the standard schedule for all of you, but for me, it's been a few weeks. I've had a few technological problems. First, OBS, the program I'm using to record this, decided it needed to update itself and it wouldn't work unless I updated it. This had the unfortunate side effect of resetting everything, which I didn't realise at the time. It also meant that a lot of my recordings were useless. Now, I'd missed out on a lot of things because I'd accidentally forgotten to record everything from the power plant up to Misty's gym battle and stuffing around near Celadon City looking for Pokemon. I decided to persevere. Then I found there were massive frame issues with all, all my recordings. Basically, everything was unusable and since I'd saved so much and updated my save states, I'd essentially lost everything I'd done in Kanto and had to play the entire game again just to get back to here. Because otherwise we'd been missing so much. I mean, I don't really have many viewers in the first place. But I want to get this done. I want to do it right. As you will probably see, things have changed. I've been making sure to level grind various Pokemon. My team has been level grinding as well. Sunny is stronger than we le when we left off. Her moves have changed a little bit. She has Barrage now for extra damage. Gibson has Fury Cutter, and otherwise things are pretty much the same, except Polari has Lock On and Thunder. I'll admit I sped up the process using the fast forward button and some cheats to let me use Master Balls to catch things occasionally and rare candies for the occasional level grinding because this is an emulator. However, we've lost quite a few things along the way. Unfortunately, King Zing the Beetle does not exist in this world. Masashi the Scyther has taken his place, and we also have Entei, Vesuvius. Ruby and Leon do still exist, though. Which box did I put Leon in? Their movesets aren't the same, but I will have to update them. I think Leon's in this one. There he is. So, it's been a real pain in the ass having to do this all over again. I am incredibly fed up with technology because the decision to reset when everything updated completely against what I wanted screwed up a whole lot of recordings and gave me a lot of extra work. And that's on top of my actual editing program winding up updating itself as well, or I had to because it wouldn't work properly, and most of the features that were free not being so. Anyway, you can find a full heal in there, and we're going to be taking on the Vermilion City Gym at long last. The traps have been deactivated, so we can battle people at our leisure. I still have Sunny at the front of the party. So we're going to be fighting a lot of electrodes if this guy is a juggler. He's basically an upgraded version of Erwin back in, back in Johto. Okay, if I can get Sleep Powder going. There we are, we should be good to go. Leech Seed. Slow and steady, but Gibson will be taking care of most of this. It is nice to actually be back and properly recording everything. But you might have noted a lot of the time I tend to act as though I have a vendetta against technology. Stupid things like that are exactly why I have my vendetta. Because I find it incredibly annoying that things don't work how I want them to, when I want them to. I'm fairly simple in what I like. I prefer things that are practical because I have no technological aptitude whatsoever. If I can't fix it with hammers, fire and shouting, then there's really not much point fixing it as far as I'm concerned. For some reason, it just sort of eludes me. And I admit that I kind of miss the days when things could be repaired very easily. Now I know this is not the most practical element for a consumer-driven society. You need to have things that work, but they also need 
to keep money flowing through the door. I just wonder why you can't have your own repair department. It's worth noting that that sort of thing did happen with car manufacturers and the like. Though of course this was a bit of a problem in some cases, for example British Leyland in the 1970s. It's estimated that they made about 80% of their profits through the back door as it was called, which was basically the service and repair department because British Leyland was not very reliable. Most of the time its workforce was on strike and when they were making things they weren't particularly good. But, as it stands, I am perfectly aware that my views on practicality and technology are perhaps somewhat outdated. I am used to things my family has had working properly. I mean, Dad's got an old stereo system from the 70s that he got going again, just a little bit of a tune-up and it was absolutely fine. Fortunately, I do have a car that's very reliable, and all my Nintendo consoles have been very reliable, but everything else, it just sort of baffles me. So. If I'm in a bit of a grumpy mood, I'm still nursing grudges over everything going wrong. But at the same time, I'm also very happy that I'm back recording this project. In the interim, I've been recording episodes of Link's Awakening, which will be a fair way into the project by the time this episode goes up. Anyway, it is much easier navigating the gym in this game. As you can see, you can head straight up. Serge's gym also features a few people who served with him during the war. He's obviously done a very good job because he's still able to command the loyalty of those people after all these years. And to be honest, Serge is a fairly tough and occasionally brash guy but he is genuinely good at heart. The remakes give him even more of a soft center. Pikachu is actually his favorite Pokemon and you can trade him for a Pikachu as well. It was a nice little touch of character. I didn't really like the sort of military style bully they made him into in the anime. And it is interesting to note that he has Pachirisu on his team in the remakes as well. Most people didn't really regard Pachirisu that much until it appeared on the championship winning team in 2014. Most Pokemon do have some sort of advantage to them, and I do kind of wish there was a bit more for Pokemon to actually become competitive, because the games are admittedly inherently unbalanced. It's a very well, it's a more casual RPG in some cases. But, I also do find it annoying that sometimes you do have to limit yourself in what you do in order to succeed. Yes, everything Karen said about winning with your favourites is true. You really should try and do that. Pick your favourite Pokemon and go from there, but you also do have to realise that unfortunately not all of them will be particularly good if it comes to serious battling. Like, I'm not going to get very much mileage out of Dash if I put him in a competitive situation. The poor guy is going to get flattened. I think he deserves a little bit better than that, but it's just the reality. In fact, most of my team probably won't do that well in competitive circles. Maybe Polari might do well? if I give him the Eviolite, because Magneton can be fairly tanky, but its poor HP lets it down. So you'll probably have to excuse the commentary being a little bit all over the place. I think I'd actually better use a full heal. And it'll wake up. Nope. So, Confusion will wrap this one up. Dragged out a little longer than I wanted it to, but I think we're finding our feet again after being a bit rusty for a while. So there we are. Surge still commands, this res commands respect from people, even to this day, and he is a pretty good guy by all accounts. 
interestingly, possibly because of his anime portrayal, he was a go-to choice for bad guys in the Pokemon manga alongside Koga and Sabrina. Alright, so... This really should be Gibson's domain, but I think if we seed it, we should be fine. Don't think Magnemite has any moves to take advantage of Lock-On. So we'll go with Sleep Powder as well, shutting down its attacks. Lock-On is very good when combined with Zap Cannon, because Zap Cannon is powerful but inaccurate. It's essentially a special class version of Dynamic Punch. 100 power, 50 accuracy always paralyzes if it hits. They added a new variant of this, Inferno, which is another special move that always burns when it winds up per hitting the target. You can use moves like uh, Telekinesis to make sure attacks like that hit, but most of the time they're not really going to be worth it. Of course, Chuck's Polyrath can use the Mind Raider Dynamic Punch combo if it wants. So there we are, Sunny is level 40, and we've cleared out the reg- well, we've almost cleared out the regular trainers, there's a Voltorb. I will switch for now. I'll put Dash in the lead. Sunny will be evolving at level 43. Oh, crumbs. So you have to show certain Pokemon in order to get certain items, and I've just realised that I can't actually get a Leaf Stone right now. Because I evolved the uh, Oddish I had into a Gloom. I was so busy doing all that work evolving various Pokemon along the way, that I completely forgot about that. You need a Licky Tongue to get the Everstone, you need Oddish in order to get the Leaf Stone, and Staryu to get the Water Stone, and then I'm not sure about the other ones, because when I did the original recordings, I somehow didn't have Staryu, even though I caught one. One more, not too challenging. Torture has Fire Punch and Thunder Punch again. He will get Flamethrower later on. Swift is also still part of the moveset. And there we are, ready to take on the gym battle at last. I'll make sure to add a bit of extra content because you had to put up with my ranting at the start. I admit, it's been a frustrating time trying to get all this done, especially since I actually did have some pretty good footage out of it all, even though I missed the battle with Misty and the power plant, but we will be getting to that. Hey little boy, I have to hand it to you. It may not be very smart to challenge me, but it takes guts. When it comes to electric Pokemon, I'm number one in America. I've never lost on the battlefield. I'll zap you just like I did my enemies in war. As always, Lieutenant Surge is rocking the army look. He le looks even more like Guile in the remakes, if I'm going to be honest. We're going to lead off with Gibson and let him tear this apart. Surge only has the one Pokemon in yellow, but it's a fairly well-leveled Raichu, quite a jump up from Misty. While you will get a fair bit of level grinding out of the SS Anne, you do need to be very careful. If you have Geodude or Graveler, you'll be able to defeat him fairly easily. But if you're just expecting to wreck him with a Diglett, then you're going to be in for a real shock, because his Raichu will hit pretty hard with some physical attacks like Mega Punch and Mega Kick. That's why you need the Rock Ground type. Rock Ground is useful, it can be handy along the way, but it has its downsides in the late game. But if you've been playing through this, 
Surge will be your first gym battle and you can handle him as easily as you've handled the Elite Four. In fact, pretty much all the gym leaders are around their level or a bit lower. There is one in particular that is really shoddy. And interesting note about Electrode. For the first two generations, this was actually the fastest Pokemon around. Electrode's base speed of 140 was a bit higher than Jolteon and Mewtwo, the fastest Pokemon of the time. Electrode isn't very strong, unfortunately, and it was hindered by the fact it didn't learn any electric attacks naturally for some time. It also doesn't get much mileage out of self-destruct and explosion, and there unfortunately isn't a special variant of those. So another Electrode, and then we can get back to the spotlights and show off Lieutenant Surge's ace Pokemon. Oddly enough, it is not his Raichu, even though Raichu is his lead. Gibson completely unfazed by Double Team. I mean, it would be kind of difficult to avoid the Earth shaking apart. Earthquakes are pretty devastating, but if you're in the right spot, I suppose it should be alright. Anyway, let's put the spotlight on Electabuzz, Lieutenant Surge's strongest Pokemon. Usually, Raichu is Lieutenant Surge's ace Pokemon, so you might be surprised to see Electabuzz getting the spotlight. It did become his strongest Pokemon in the Johto games, and Electabuzz is a fairly dependable Pokemon. It has some pretty good stats, with decent special attack and pretty good speed. It was one of the few Pokemon which could learn Thunder Punch in these generations, but it crucially learns Thunderbolt as well, which is a very good move that was hard to get in these games. Electabuzz gained its baby form Elekid in this generation, and to be honest it probably didn't need that, because Elekid is actually a fairly strong baby Pokemon in its own right. It's actually a lot stronger than most first form Pokemon. Electivire, on the other hand, is a pretty good addition because it allows you to play Electabuzz and Electivire completely differently as Electivire goes down the physical attack route. This is most likely to contrast it with the more special attack focused Magmortar. As I have mentioned earlier in Jinx's spotlight, the Electabuzz line and the Magma line tend to be treated as foils to each other. They play slightly differently and tend to appear in different versions. While it does wind up appearing late in the game, Electabuzz is still a very dependable Pokemon. In Crystal version, you might be able to get an Elekid from a special egg. If you do, Electabuzz will be a great choice for an electric type Pokemon. And let's get ready to take it down with Earthquake. Shoulda used Reflect, buddy. And Gibson gets his opportunity to play. He's one-shot everything. I really like Sandslash. It might not stand up as well as Donphan did, but it's still a great Pokemon. Ugh! You are strong! Okay, boy, you get Thunder Badge! There we go. First badge in Kanto. Fairly easy to get. Thunder Badge increases Pokemon speed! Consider it proof that you defeated me! You wear it proudly! In America! By the way, have you heard anything from my cousin Keith? He might be a complete asshole who wastes his time cheating at children's card games, but I still look out for him anyway. Say hi to him! In Canada! We can also, as you've seen, just surf past that little bush there. And run straight into a wild Pokemon. Well, it's nice to know that nothing has changed, and it's fairly high level on top of that. It's probably the highest level Pokemon we're going to be seeing around these parts for some time. Also worth noting, now we've done that, we can stop off at the Pokemon fan club. Talk to this guy because he is important to remember. And take note of this Clefairy doll. Also very important, but we'll get to that. 
Speak to the chairman of the Pokemon fan club. And listen to him talk about his favourite, Rapidash. It is implied he's rambling on a lot, but Rapidash does have some perks. Interestingly, Ponyta has one of the highest base stat totals of first form Pokemon. Its base stat total is 410. It actually comes in 5 points lower than Dash's. Ponyta has lower HP, and its defenses, its physical defense is a little bit lower. Speed ties with Dash, but it has higher attack, special attack, and special defense. When it evolves into Rapidash, all its base stat totals go up by 15 points. It's not a huge jump in stats, unfortunately, so... Rapidash doesn't quite feel like a huge improvement compared to Ponyta sometimes. Nonetheless, that is probably rather uncharitable to say. I mean, I do like using Rapidash, but as far as fire types go, I'm going to be honest, I really do prefer Arcanine. And Torture, of course. We can't forget him because he is putting in serious work. Anyway, if we head off to the east, we will find our path blocked by good old Snorlax. There was a Snorlax by Celadon City, if you'll remember. That one is no longer there, and we will find out why later. But, let's take a bit of time to wander on towards Saffron City. Now, there is a shortcut here, but there is a man standing in the way. There is indeed a problem at the power plant. We'll do a couple of things in Saffron City. I'll wrap up the episode by taking you on a quick tour. Over here is the Pokemon Center. Fairly easy to find. If you head along here, just like in the first games, you will meet Mr. Psychic. Talk to him. And you will get TM29, Psychic. We will, in due time, be teaching that to Sunny. I'll probably do that once I get another TM, because we will have to wait to get an Oddish. Here is the Silphco headquarters. We can't go very far. Security was boosted after the problem with Team Rocket. That said, if you have Porygon, you can now trade it, holding the upgrade. You will get Porygon 2. As I mentioned in its spotlight, Porygon 2 can actually be a versatile defensive Pokemon. When it holds the Eviolite, it can be fairly bulky. It'll still hit pretty hard as well. If we head up here, this is Copycat's house. It has moved from where it was. Remember its location though. We don't need to go there just yet. It used to be up here, but this is the Magnet Train Station. There's the gateway out, the fighting dojo is here as well, and the Saffron City Gym. There is no one to challenge here, but... We will be instructed as to where the Karate King has gone, and we will get the Focus Band as well. This is a hold item that has a chance of stopping a Pokémon from fainting. The Focus Sash works if a Pokémon would be knocked out from full health. The Focus Band can work at any time, but unfortunately it does have a fairly slim chance. And if you want to grab some items, the Mart is just down there. Anyway, there's a straight stretch of road that leads up to Cerulean City. The daycare centre in Kanto is there, but you can't breed there. We shall wrap things up here. You can wander up to Cerulean City in your own time, and I will meet you up there. Thank you very much for joining me, and I'll see you in the next instalment of our scenic tour through the Kanto region.